Dune Part 2 is finally hitting theaters March the 1st. Let's get into it. This is the Entertainment Answer. This is the Entertainment Answer. I am Matt Mungle. Looking at Dune Part 2 in theaters March the 1st, the long-anticipated Part 2 of Dune. Once again, we get a monumental production that needs to be seen and heard on the big screen. If you got an IMAX, go see it. If you have an IMAX 70mm, lucky you. Check it out there for sure. Dune Part 1 sort of left us hanging. We were there on Arrakis with uh, House Atreides. Things went awry. Most of House Atreides killed. Paul and his mom escaped. Part 2 pretty much picks up where Part 1 left off. If you need to go back and revisit Part 1 of Dune, you can watch it on Max. I think it's even on Netflix now. So there's plenty of opportunities for you to go back and re-watch the first one just to familiarize yourself with the characters, the landscape, everything that was going on on Arrakis. There were even some things I had forgotten about that I think revisiting the film helped out a lot going into part two. Part two covers a lot of ground, both plot-wise and actually on the landscape of Arrakis. Part of me really wishes this would have been a miniseries where we could have really did a deep dive into Paul's journey, his guidance by the Fremen, him getting accustomed to the land of Arrakis. But here in the movie, it's like it jumps around a lot. Like one minute he's heading out into the desert. No spoiler alerts here. One minute he'll be heading out in the desert to do a task. The next minute he's in a battle. And it's like they're, they're just having to really rush through things as Paul gets used to his life on Arrakis. And there was a lot of that. I was like, oh wait, but what about this? Or wait, what about that? And we don't get a lot of that. I mean, it's two hours and 45 minutes. You would think we would get a lot. And we get a lot. But there's a lot of the backstory and a lot of what Paul goes through that we that we just don't get enough of, I feel like, in part two. Some things to keep your eye out for in part two. Obviously, the relationship between Paul and Shawnee, played by Zendaya, who she is a Fremen. She is there. She trusts Paul. She doesn't trust Paul. Uh, she doesn't think that he is the Messiah like everybody else does. But she trusts that his heart is in the right place when he says he wants to really help the people of Arrakis. Another key point of this film is the turmoil in the house of Harkonnen. As you know, Harkonnen used to control Arrakis until it was given by the emperor over to House Atreides, and Harkonnen didn't like it. They came in, wiped out Atreides, have now taken over again the spice mining on Arrakis. But there's a lot of turmoil going on in that house, and which brings about a lot of really cool characters and a neat storyline to go along with Paul's. We met Beast Raban, who's played by Dave Batista in the first part. Here we meet his, I guess it's his cousin, maybe his younger cousin, who, uh, man, this character, I love this character to death. His name is Fade Rotha, played by Austin Butler, and it's almost unrecognizable what Austin Butler does with this role. We just recently saw him in Elvis, which was super cool. He actually became Elvis. Took him a while after the movie to not be Elvis. Uh, uh, hopefully he was able to transition out of this roll a lot quicker. But uh, Austin Butler, almost unrecognizable. Looks like they just plucked him from Mad Max Fury Road or something of that nature because he's just kind of like just this pale complexion and just almost snowy, powdery. But man, he is psychotic and intense, but also very fluid in the way he looks at things. So it's not just a, a rage like Beast has. It's more of a controlled, just psychotic nature about him that's just so much fun to watch. You don't like him, but man, is he fun to watch in this one. So that's another key element to keep your eye on in part two. Paul's mother, Jessica, also takes on a pretty big role in this one as well as she is transitioned into the role of a reverend mother. I don't want to, again, spoil too much in this. She wants people to see Paul as this messiah that they've all expect expected. So there's a lot that goes on with this storyline of him trying to go against uh, the house Harkonnen to reestablish his father's domain and to kind of rebuild House Atreides in this. And so there's a lot of going on. There's a lot of inner turmoil within the houses. There's a lot of inner turmoil on Arrakis between the north and the south as far as if Paul is really the, the chosen one that's going to come and save them all. The scene stealer in all of this is Stilgar. We met Stilgar, played by Javier Bardem, in part one. And in this one, he literally steals the film. If you remember No Country for Old Men, he played this character called Shigur. 
And Bardem does the same thing in this one where he will he, he will have these upbeat conversations, but then he'll get very serious about what he's saying and then kind of make a joke, or is it a joke? And his uh, relationship with Paul is very, very cool in this one as he wants to train Paul in the ways of Arrakis and to uh, just help him to maybe become uh, one of the Fremen and to live their lifestyle and to be what they, he needs to be there in Arrakis. So it's really fun and endearing to watch them two together. And what Javier Bardem does with the character is super, super cool. Some people think we didn't get enough worm in part one. Well, you're going to get a lot of the worm in part two, or worms, plural even. So the worm becomes a very cool character in this one. And Arrakis, the planet as a whole, does. Just how the rebels use the sand area, how they use the sand and the climate of Arrakis to their benefit when it comes to warfare. And uh, the worms are cool. I mean, they ride these things like horses. I dig the way that the worms are used, and there's a lot of it that, that comes into play in this one. So if you missed out on the worms, you thought they weren't utilized in part one, you're going to get a really nice dose of those here in part two. Is the film too long? Two hours and 46 minutes. Uh, there's parts of it in the middle that feel long, but the last act and a half is really, really cool. We see Timothy really come into his role as Paul Atreides in this one and does a really great job. I wasn't sure if Timothy could pull off the strong warrior leader messiah uh, role, but man, he does a really great job in this. And I was really pleased to see him make Paul believable uh, in, in all aspects of what Paul is. But part two does have a little bit of downtime, but again, the payoff and the ending is super cool. So it's worth the journey for sure. Again, see it in IMAX. If you have an IMAX 70 millimeter, check it out there for sure. Normally, I don't push so hard for movies to be seen in the theaters, but uh, Dune Part 2, I think, needs to just because of the scope and the uh, just the aspects that are in this film that just make it hit so much better. So uh, it's a lot of fun. Check it out if you're into the storyline. Buckle up. I mean, fans of the books know that there's more coming even than from part two. So uh, we get a lot in this one, but it does set it up for a lot more to come as well. So again, Dune part two in theaters, March the 1st. For everything that we do, like, follow, and subscribe for the Entertainment Answer. I'm Matt Mungle.